Hello, everyone. We are live and recording. Happy Sunday. I'm Kellyanne from Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore, and I have the lovely pleasure of introducing you to our authors that we have today for our event. I keep having like this thing where I want to say tonight, and it's today um, <laughs> because we're doing an afternoon event. Uh, we have Kat Ward with us. She's the recipient of the Shirley Jackson Award and the first and only woman to win the August Derleth Prize, the British Fantasy Awards, twice. Her newest book um, came out, I believe, was it last week? This month? This The 28th right? of September. Yeah, the yeah. Okay, so just before this month. Um, her newest book, The Last House on Needless Street. Uh, we also have with us our veteran conversation partner, Paul Tremblay. <laughs> He's the author of multiple acclaimed horror books, including The Cabin at the End of the World, Head Full of Ghosts, and Survivor Song. Before I kick it off to them for the event, just a couple of house rules on the right hand side, you'll find our lovely chat section. Feel free to say hello and make comments to our authors as the event goes on. And below our video, you'll find a green button that says buy books with signed personalized book plates. Uh, if you click that, it'll take you to Mysterious Galaxy where you can buy The Last House on Needless Street. And you can also request a personalized book plate from Kat by writing what you'd like her to make that out to in your order comments. And then last but not least, Below that, you'll find the ask a question button. If you click that, you can type a question for Kat at the end of the bit. So with that, I'm going to turn my screen off and let the event get started. Have a great one, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Kellyanne. Uh, hi, Kat. Welcome to San Diego. <laughs> hi, Paul. I, I like so to pretend much. I'm in yeah. San Diego, yeah. Even though there's <laughs> like, what, four different time zones working here? I'm still working out the math. I know it, it is actually an evening event for me. Because right. it's like it's yeah. 10 p.m. here, so I'm, you yeah. know. Look, those Californians have their afternoon, I suppose. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start. I have a ton of questions for Kat, but I do want her, I did actually ask her if she, she would read a little bit from her book. Um, one, because I, I, I don't know if I've said this to you, but I just love your style and your prose. Like, that's actually one of the things where I'm going to ask about you later. So I think it'd be worth people who are here or haven't read your stuff before to hear you read a little bit from it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So I'll read, um, as is traditional, I'll begin at the beginning. Um, so, um, Ted Bannerman. Today is the anniversary of Little Girl with Popsicle. It happened by the lake 11 years ago. She was there and then she wasn't. So it's already a bad day when I discover that there is a murderer among us. Olivia lands heavily on my stomach first thing, making high-pitched sounds like clockwork. If there's anything better than a cat on the bed, I don't know about it. I fuss over her because when Lauren arrives later, she will vanish. My daughter and my cat won't be in the same room. I'm up, I say. It's your turn to make breakfast. She looks at me with those yellow-green eyes and then pads away. She finds a disc of sun, flings herself down, and blinks in my direction. Cats don't get jokes. I fetch the newspaper from the front step. I like the local because it has a rare bird alert. You can write in if you see something special like a northern flicker or a Siberian accent or... Even this early, the dim air is warm as soup. The street feels even quieter than usual, hushed, like it's remembering. When I see the front page, my stomach goes into curls and knots. There she is. I forgot it was today. I'm not so good with time. They always use the same picture. Her eyes are big in the shadow of her hat brim. The fingers clenched on the stick as if she thinks someone might take it away from her. Her hair lies wet and sheeny on her skull, short as a boy's. She has been swimming, but no one is wrapping her in a fluffy towel to dry her. I don't like that. She might catch cold. They don't print the other picture, the one of me. They got in big trouble for that. No, not big enough, if you ask me. She was six. Everyone was upset. We have a problem with that around here, especially by the lake, so things happen fast. The police searched the houses of everyone in the county who might hurt children. I wasn't allowed to wait inside while they did it, so I stood out on the steps. It was summer, bright and hot as the surface of a star. Be there. Yay. Uh, it's such a brilliant introduction to, to Teddy and sort of the, you know, the sort of the main sort of like crises <laughs> within the novel. Um, so... I'm going to, just so you know, I'm probably going to sound like really fumbly asking questions because I'm going to do my best to not spoil anything and have you only talk about what you're comfortable talking about with this book. Um, 
because I do You've got think, to talk around the book. Yeah, we're going to talk around the book. the book. It's not yeah. really a book. It's really uh, words on pages. Uh, <laughs> all right. So first, um, geez, I was going to go there. But look, since you had you start off reading, let's let's talk about the book first before a couple of general bio questions I had for you. Anyway, uh, I do want to know, like, I'll be interested to see how you could answer this. But what was sort of the spark? What was the, you know, sort of the what if that that drove that drove this novel? Well, it started out, and as you will know, it grew very much beyond this, but it started out because I am completely fascinated by serial killers and their pets. Um, hmm. Because I think there's something, there's something so sinister and ominous about the, the animal being trapped in a relationship in which it's sort of forced to love this other person who has no emotional, aff uh, no emotional affect or empathy or anything. Um, and unbeknownst to them, they're, they're trapped. And it, it seems like another form of captivity and another form of coercion and cruelty, really. And there are such striking examples like um, Dennis Nilsson, who, if people aren't familiar, is an English serial killer who killed and ate quite a lot of vulnerable young men during the 70s and 80s. And he had a dog called Bleep, who was absolutely, absolutely um, besotted with it. And the only thing he cared about when he was arrested was what was going to happen to Bleep. Um, Myra Hindley this really this story kind of reaches a cold finger into my heart even still even though I, I'm, I'm very familiar with it had a dog called puppet which i think is first of all one of the creepiest names i've ever heard for, for a pet <laughs> at all but she um they you know the the famous pictures of the moors murderers where they they found the graves of the children because the they were Myra Hill and Ian Brady took pictures of themselves standing in these very triumphant poses on the moor and they thought well what what if there's more significance to these locations than ju than just like random photographs, um one of the ways that they they tried to ascertain the locations and dates of these is by sort of carbon dating the dog her dog, huh. so they took pu puppet and 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 uh, anesthetized him and sort of did lots of tests on him in order to, to date the photographs and 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 see what which victims might be lying where and it worked unfortunately puppet did not make it so it's um the tests actually wow. um killed him so it's a really macabre story in every possible way so and it just makes you think of if, if you anthropomorphize this pet and this animal who's the mercy of this person and of these events that they just don't understand they're the ultimate naive narrator so I started out with Olivia, the cat. Um, <laughs> part of this book is narrated by a gay Bible reading talking cat. And if you get past that, this might be the book for you. Um, <laughs> it's a litmus <laughs> test, I think. <laughs> but um, so I started out with Olivia and I I really, I really knew that this was an a, a, a kernel of the story, but what I found as I was, as I grew to, as I as I carried on the journey, was that it was too narrow a canvas. There was just this enormous story which I I suddenly realised I wasn't addressing, which was about trauma and 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 survival, um, and the resilience of the human mind in in these circumstances, which actually, uh, sh you know, people shouldn't be able to survive, let alone mm. thrive. So that was the starting point, and but as you know, it it grew a lot from that and sort of grew sort of outwards like a pearl <laughs> i'm adding layers all the yeah. time you know oh that's really interesting uh yeah that I, that i hadn't read about like how you began with the story so i'm a little surprised i i hadn't heard those stories about those in a good way like wow yeah um and you answered my question about the cat <laughs> somewhat um because i was gonna say i you know i have to admit um and i think it's from you know, more than a decade ago where I used to slush read for fantasy magazines, some other yeah. magazines. And I can't tell you how many stories we got from the point of view of pets. Um, right. So I'm like, I've been scarred by that, but like you have me with very skeptical. Within the, we'll yeah. Soon. Within the first couple of sentences, like, Oh, okay. Um, this is interesting. It's not and even as a dog person, <laughs> which was also a hurdle for well, me to come over. <laughs> Everyone has their personal battle with this book and this was yours. Yes. Um, but I, I mean, I just think like it is um it, it, i had the same resistance as you though like i didn't want it to be cute i didn't right. want it to be sentimental and i didn't want it to be cozy and it's very difficult to know how to write a pet without doing those things so it was a really yes. fine line that i felt like i wanted to tread i sort of tried it every day going oh am i tipping over into into nice you know yeah oh, that's a great answer i mean i mean that's exactly it there is you know with uh, with Olivia, there is not a, a shred of sentimentality there. Um, so, like, it sounds like you were you were sort of aware of those uh, potential 
pitfalls? Well, I think if you, I think if you're going to write, if you're going to do something quite stylistically decisive like that, you've got to think about mm. the repercussions of it, um, and also, it just, it, it was, it was just very, it was very apparent to me that um, the book had to be more of one whole. And the thing is, as you know, it's a very dark world. It's mm. not a, it's not an easy place to spend time, and I, you, you just couldn't introduce like like a jolly, a jolly, quite nice cat voice into the middle of that. It had to have the acerbic and have the teeth, you know, um, quite literally. And um, the way I, the way I kind of went about it was to treat it like, I don't know if you know, if you're like the, the most kind of like scathing or coruscating of David Sedaris's essays, the ones that reveal him as the sort of, where he's revealing him, the worst parts of himself and and in, in this irresistible comic way but like you're still like god you're a monster you know i <laughs> i thought that's what i want actually that's the tone i want is this sort of really really uneasy balance where you're not quite sure perhaps whose side you're on at any given point mm. oh that's great no and i think that's one of the real pleasures of the book um beyond sort of what gets played up and I don't mean to dismiss it at all. Like, you know, how there are, you know, some really amazing, you know, sort of story twists, which, um, you know, I'm obviously going to stay far away from, but like, for me, it was, it was really, I mean, I, I thought the twist and w where the story ends up is amazing. But for me, what I really was drawn to was how the story was being told the voices and we were drawn into these characters. So I want to ask you, with that in mind, we already talked about Olivia. We don't have to go through every single character mm. individually, but what was the, the challenge in this book of, you know, the multiple and mostly yeah. first person narrators, uh, like trying to keep all those, <laughs> keep all those characters sort of in, you know, metaphorical okay, yeah. juggling balls in the air. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, so I this, I think for me, first person narrators are actually, um, they, they're, they're much more, realistic they have much more much more of a they carry much more verisimilitude than, than an omniscient third person narrator you know it, they have it's, it's a bit too much like life actually which is like why i think it can make people uncomfortable the unreliable right. first person narrator because you you're deprived of those securities that you that you you you, go, you look to fiction for because fiction has to make more sense than life that's its job um <laughs> you know and it you know it, it has rules and character development and securities which life so not notably lacks and I think that what, so for me, it, it seems a much more natural way to tell a story, which is in fractured, broken, partial narratives, because mm. it's exactly how we learn things and, and talk about things as well. I think also, but with these, with these particular narratives, I don't think I've ever gone as close, you know, if we think about person as being, you know, yeah. close or distant, I don't think I've ever gone as close as this before. I sort of, I felt like I was wearing them like a skin at times, um, which it was, it's not always a pleasant feeling, but mm. I, I think that's also what adds to the, the sort of disorientating nature of the book is that if you look at anything in too much, focus into too much detail first of all it, it, it tends to become sort of um alienating and horrifying anyway <laughs> but to be plunged you know anything looked at too closely is sort of is sort of scary mm. detail is kind of menacing in, in its own right but um it, with the voices i thought that to be you know it's sort of almost make it's making the reader another form of coercion of captivity that almost in the way i was talking about the cat before is you're trapping the reader in this point of view and just forcing them to to go moment to moment with the character and that was that was the effect i really wanted to really wanted to achieve it's not a very it's not a pleasant one i don't think um mm. necessarily yeah no i mean it, it totally it felt both at the same time like incredibly intimate but also suffocating at times but like yeah <laughs> in the best way possible um yeah. no I, well, again i thought it was an amazing balance uh also because you know if you would gone like you know, third or, or even any sort of level of omniscience. It's a little bit of a cheat from, you know, some of the secrets for, that the characters yeah. do eventually, you know, let their, or discover yeah. themselves or let the, the readers in on. Um, mm. Was there any part, uh, well, let me ask this first instead. So readers don't do this, but in the back there is a bibliography. <laughs> yeah. So I take that as evidence that you had to do quite a bit of research for this book. Um, and as someone who breaks yeah. out in hives at the thought of research, um, <laughs> I was going to leave yeah. you a very open-ended question to talk about was that, 
I mean, did you find that to be a pleasure in and of itself? Like, you know, once you figured out what the story was, you went out and researched a whole bunch of stuff. Like, I don't know, okay. like, how, did, besides obviously learning what you needed to learn, was there an mm -hmm. element of, you know, the incredible amount of research that you did that was surprising and how it changed or affected the story? I think so, yeah. And it also affected me as well. I, I felt I was very, um, I felt my a lot of my worldview kind of slightly moved a bit to the left by some of the things that people told me or, or that I, mm. um, that I, that I, you know, the conversations I had. Um, as I said, I was just, um, earlier, I think I've referred to like the resilience of the human mind. I was actually bowled over by some of the things that um, I was, it, I, was, there was, I was lucky enough to have shared with me by mm. people I spoke to. Um, I, I felt like the world was very much a stranger place after I, after I, 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 I did that huh. research. And I feel like in a way it's just, it's a bit weird, isn't it? It's like the book wrote, was writing me at the same time as I was writing it. There's a kind of reciprocal process going on there. Um, the main thing that I felt I wanted perhaps to really be sure of my ground on is I think there can be, not always, but I think there can be, and I, I think you perhaps um, have got a little, you know, you've, you've dipped your toe artistically into this as well, but um, there can be a bit of a horror problem with depictions of mental health. Um, oh, sure. Uh, and so I think I wanted to use the conventions of horror, which I'm really fond of and I have a huge affection for, to do something a little bit different. Um, I felt like the, res the research was, was critical because I, I don't think you can really write about some of the things I chose to write about without yeah. really doing your due diligence. Um, it's incredibly sensitive material, a lot of it. And um, I, I really didn't, I didn't want to get it wrong because I don't like getting sure. it wrong. Right. Also, but also I felt that um, it would be a bit of a slap in the face to uh, people who have, you know, gone through um, extraordinary and and um, uh, dreadful ex experiences. If I hadn't at least asked them what they thought about it, right. and, and tried to represent that experience as, as 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 closely as I could, it's not an own voices narrative. It's not it's not my story. But right. I was just so fascinated by it. I thought the. I, I just got to do my best to sink myself into this into these perspectives and and know as much as I can. And God, I mean, and it really did. As I said, I opened them, opened my eyes, and um, it was a really, it, it, yeah, a, a bit of a kind of you know light light breaking in moment for me. I, I I felt I felt I did feel like I understood understood the world differently afterwards. Yeah, no, I definitely got that sense again, readers, you know, going uh, ahead to see this, but, you know, I could feel that. I mean, it felt like your afterward was just full of, you know, essentially, you know, raw personal emotion about like what you'd gone through in writing the book, which, uh, again, I mean, obviously <laughs> read the book, but I found that to be incredibly, uh, you know, interesting and compelling as well. Um, so I get with all that in mind, I mean, I think you probably already answered this question, but I'll ask this too. Was there, once you were in this book, was there a time or a part of the process for you that, that scared you or intimidated you, but you just kind of plowed ahead anyway. I mean, I guess I mean, you talked whole, about that a little bit, but. The whole thing actually, to be yeah. honest, like I, I went, every time I got up to, in the morning to write this book, I was like, I don't know if I can do this today. Oh no. <laughs> like, well, not, not just yeah. emotionally, although that was a big part of it, but just it's, it's very much like a tightrope act over. It felt really dangerous. Like that, the writing, the, all the balls in the air, as you said, but also just the, the sort of very, very kind of tight, delicate balance of of, of style and character. And I, I genuinely thought, like, I don't know if I can actually do this. Can I do this? Let's see if I can. And that was that was really exciting as well. Um, to, well, exciting in a, in a sort of terrifying way. Yeah. Um, there was a bit. There was a bit where I I couldn't ah uh, I, I I couldn't write it. If I say yeah. like the word vinegar, I right. think you'll know which bit I'm talking about. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't write that bit. And it was getting down to the deadline. Like I think it was, it was like a day before I had to send it off. And I still had this hole in the oh, manuscript wow. where I hadn't written it. I knew exactly what I had to go there. I knew what mm -hmm. the scene was. I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to write mm. it. And I did in the end, obviously. But yeah. it was I it's horrible because you do have to you know you do have to you have to live everything you write and you you know you are all of your characters and what you do to them and and what and what they do and it felt like something I just didn't want to be or do 
but I did. Um, but mm. it's it was a lesson, I think, in that, you know, I, it, I didn't realise I was going to be that affected by it, I think. Before, yeah. But when mm. I got to the you know, to a day before the deadline, I still had this hole, like this gap in, in, my, yeah. in my book. I thought, well, actually, it's something to think about there, really. Well, uh, okay. Well, let's... Uh... Let's shift gears because I feel like we're making you reliving some suffering. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I asked, like, what was the scariest, most intimidating part? Like, when did you know? Like, and, and don't let, let's not be falsely modest. Like, when did you know? I was like, oh, this is this is a really good book. <laughs> I've got something here. I, um, it could be even after, like, you went through edits. Like, was there a time when you realized, I, oh, people I, might go crazy? I mean, people might like really go gaga over this. I don't. I. I'm not sure I had that moment until quite late in the process, actually, because yeah. to be honest, this was my like, if I may, I'm not going to swear, but this was my kind of like new book, really, because yeah. huh. I felt, yeah, I, I felt like it was, it was my act of defiance um, huh. in the sense that I felt that um, I, I was, I kind of went, you know, I hadn't had very, like Little Eve, which I, which was, I was very proud of, I think sold yeah. minus copies its first year. I don't know how that's possible, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought, you know what, I may not get another chance at this. Um, mm. Because, if, you know, the book industry is an industry, um, as you know, it's based as full of amazing creative um, people as it is, it's, it's a business. And I just thought there's a chance I won't get to do this again. So I'm gonna, you know, have one more shot, and I'm just gonna write right. the book that the, the most mad anarchic book that I have in my, in my heart and brain. And, and I did. And I, I think, it felt so risky and actually prove, you know, definitely in the early stages of trying to sell it, people were like, and uh, just explain this to me. We're like, yeah. what? Like, <laughs> and uh, um, it, 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 it didn't seem like it was going to go anywhere. I think I was really, really proud of it in the sense that I'd done what I set out to do, which was an incredibly, quite, a, quite an ambitious idea. Mm. But I think it was when there was a, uh, there was a moment when I think a very lovely author called Natasha Pulley tweet, tweeted about it. And she said, this is the best horror novel I've ever read. And I thought, oh, that's, a bit of, that's a bit of an overreaction, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I also thought, you know what, actually, maybe people will actually, it won't just be the, sort of my final, you know, defiant sort of swan song. Maybe people will actually connect with it. Uh, and yeah. I, I, I think I hadn't thought about that aspect of it, actually, or allowed myself to think about it that much. Um, but I'm just really, I, I think I've, I, when I, when I um, finished Olivia's story as well, I was quite proud of that. I thought, you know, she's, that, that was a, that was a journey that I'm proud to have told. <laughs> um, but it's, it's funny with that, isn't it? Because I was, even, even, even um, I, like, just before it came out, I was looking through it and I was like, this isn't very good, is it? Like, oh. <laughs> it's yeah. just the way, it's just the way that your, you know, your, your writerly brain um, just has that go to, doesn't right. it? Where, you know. I mean, what do you think of your, do you, do you have moments where you think, yes, I've done my job now? Um, sometimes actually I was just sort of like thinking, uh, coincidentally, like, huh, like, you know, you described this as your FU book. Like you thought it was your last shot. I mean, Headful Ghost was the mm -hmm. same thing for me. Really? Whereas like, oh, this is, you know, cause my first two attempts, my second book definitely sold negative copies. <laughs> uh, right. No Sleep to Wonderland. Yeah. But no, this was like, and I was like, mired in a different book and i had this idea for that one and i was like you know what i'm gonna write this one yeah it's and i don't know maybe everyone should just be writing their few books yeah <laughs> right? maybe. that's where you know you feel unsure you feel but also excited about like what you could possibly do and it's okay if you fail like i think that's you know one of the things yeah. that you have to learn to, to tell yourself uh it just i mean it's it's funny though isn't it like because you never and, you know, it's the books where you feel, well, or the writing where you, I remember there are a couple of times where I felt like quite safe and pleased with it. And it's just been dreadful. And so it is only when you, as you say, feel a bit uncertain that it seems to turn yeah. out any, any good. Um, it's a cruel, so it, just in case people out there aren't, yeah, aren't, aren't aware. I mean, this was like, uh, this has been a, a, a big bestseller in England, correct? Yes, I mean, yes, yeah. Th th yeah. yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you knew all I had to do was write yeah. a talk book about a talking cat, right? So, a bit big, you know, hit in England. I mean, what, is there any part of that experience or the response that was a surprise or your favorite part? I really enjoyed having a Zoom call with Andy Circus. <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. yeah, 
because I they I really enjoyed that bit, and they were all, there was this really surreal moment where because they because at the Imaginarium, which is Andy Circus and Jonathan Cavendish have optioned it, and there was this really surreal moment where Andy Circus was quoting me back to myself quoting mm -hmm. from a blog interview I gave in like 2014 and being like, I really like what you said here. And I was like, this is not real. <laughs> this is insane. Um, and he was really all like that. CGI, like some, he was all like a CGI <laughs> person. <Yeah. laughs> he was, he was, he was kind of devastatingly kind of glamorous actually. Mm. Um, and very, very kind of like presence, very like, you, can, you, you know, he just reeks charisma, but um. I really enjoyed that, and partly because I thought that they, you know, that it, it spoke so well of them, and it made me feel incredibly uh, uh, kind of excited about giving them, you know, f free reign with it. Um, yeah. I really, I really enjoyed, um, and I didn't expect this at all. And I, in fact, if anything, I was, I was, I had, I held out no, um, I deliberately held out no hopes that this would uh, be something that. Um, people who have been through similar experiences would necessarily gravitate to partly because why would you want to relive um, mm -hmm. something that, you know, that, that you've already lived and, and, right. um, and fully experienced and, and it was quite traumatic. But there have been a couple of people who have reached out to me and said that that was, that they felt represented by the book and they felt, and they enjoyed it and they enjoyed the book yeah. being about them, right. um, which I thought was really, uh, that was unexpected. And I, I certainly don't expect it to be true across the board for everyone. You know, this, right. this, is not, this is not a sort of, it's, it's, it's not supposed to represent everyone, but it's, it was a story sure. that I hoped would, hoped would resonate with, you know, and, and not alienate people who, who had similar experiences. So that was really nice. Um, and yeah, it was just, oh, and it went, it, yeah, there were nice, there were really nice bits. Like they put the, they put it on the telly. Books never get on the telly, do they? <laughs> That's great. No, definitely yeah. not. No. Yeah. So it's, it's been really lovely. And I um, was, was this is a, a first for me. I never had any um, experience quite like it. So it's been, it's, it's been wonderful. I, and, yeah. and as I said, you know, to come out of that sort of act of kind of like, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's just sort of per feels perfect in a way. Oh, that's amazing. And, and all, all well-deserved. Uh, so everybody at home, I assume you're home. I suppose you could be walking outside with your phone or something. <laughs> uh, I'm shortly going to go through a lightning round of questions and then we will open up questions to you. The place to put questions is in the ask the questions area down below. But before I go lightning round, we'll, we'll treat this like a pre lightning round. Cause I do want to get a couple of quick things out. I did want to ask you about, um, as someone who's like a hopeless lifelong New Englander who hasn't really moved around at all, um, you know, in your bio, born in DC and, you know, all these different places in the world that you've yeah. lived. Uh, I don't know. Um, I assume that you feel like it certainly informs your writing, I assume, as as well as informing you as a person. Um, I just want to know, like, if you ever like felt like, oh, this is like maybe where something comes in. Because I know I've, the, the, the things I've, I'm fumbling over this, but the things I've read from you, it's been in different areas like it's not like all these books are sitting yeah. in england it's anyway so how's that for fumbling i think it's it's all not at all it's yeah. um, it's pure trendy um but <laughs> it's um i think i think that all my books are about um uh people who don't belong who don't fit mm. in i mean you, uh, that sounds very generic doesn't it because most books uh, mo most books are uh, uh, oh that's yeah. a great sort of rich vein for books anyway but you know people who are in settings they don't f feel familiar or at ease with lonely people i think um although it was an amazing upbringing and i wouldn't change it for the world you know it was before the internet and if, and, and um you know letters took six months to reach madagascar um, you know, you couldn't take friends with you or anything. So it's every three years you'd be completely uprooted and you'd go somewhere else. Amazing. But that's it. There was no continuity at all. And I, and I, I think that the focus on family as well in, in the books is always because I'm, it's, it's in a sort of, I'm obsessed with this bond because I think because my, my, my own family bond is so strong. I, the idea that it could go wrong or be, or, or go awry is sort of, the, one of the most terrifying things that I can imagine yeah. and what is writing but sharing what you're afraid of um <laughs> so in in that sense I think it made its way into the books very strongly I think that uh, yeah I, I think I, I like to explore I, I like I'd really like to, to set my books a, a 
different place each each time if I can because I also think landscape is such an important thing in them and they but you know mm. th there's a real reciprocity between the character between character plot and and the land in in what I write and I, I and so it always it always needs each one needs its own particular kind of backdrop like the new in, like the um the Washington State backdrop for Needle Street was just, it was just so obvious that's mm. land that swallow, can swallow people whole and has done um, right. you know it's the terrible uh, you know long history of being the haunt of serial killers um and but also the, the only temperate rainforest in the u.s uh, uh, no in this in the world and mm. it's just those jurassic ferns that are taller than you are it's it's everything about it just has this slight, slight air of unreality and 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 menace yeah just like the well you were talking about family and i'm enjoying yeah. that you're talking about family in your bond while you're at your parents house with this kind of creepy looking covered <laughs> apparently with walls filled with horse hair and blood yes yes that's right <laughs> yeah they did some they did some i was telling paul this before we started they did some renovations in the kitchen and this is this bit this bit is actually 14th century i think but so they they just they, they exposed an old wall and it, it was the grossest thing i've ever seen it was <laughs> It was like it was it was um kind of um uh like like clay plaster, but held together because they used to use this as a sort of as a sort of like um like um like stabilizing agent yeah. it, it like yeah it, or like just yeah. just just as a stabilizing agent to like keep everything together. Hmm. It was it was um mixed with blood, and you could see all of this like gross old like centuries old horse hair all curled up in it like that. It was truly, I mean, you wonder where I get my ideas. <laughs> Sometimes they're just right in front of you. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, with that in mind, we're going to start the lightning round. So these have to be like your okay. first response, right. short okay. answer. Ready. I can't be blamed for some of the questions. I mean, I okay. can be, but all right. Yeah. Some of these will be easy. Well, maybe not. What's your favorite book with an animal narrator? Watership Down. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Correct. <laughs> uh, as a writer, no book. <laughs> I knew there was a writing yeah. role. You can only choose one thing, a notebook or a laptop. Oh, laptop. I can't write longhand. I'm, yeah, I'm just either. too, <clears throat> I can't do it anymore. I've lost the gift, you know? Yes. Uh, a contemporary writer you admire. Uh, Kenny Link. Good answers, man. I'm going to steal these if I ever get these questions. <laughs> oh, man. All right. How about, I'm sorry. I just can't read my own writing. Uh, you can name a book or a film with a twist that you didn't see coming. And that was, you know, you were like, oh. A, a Kiss Before Dying by Ira Levin. The twist comes in the oh. first 10, like 50 pages, I think. Okay. It's, a, um, it's just the one that comes to me because it's so clever. Do you know mm. the one I mean? No, I haven't read that. Yeah. It's, it, I'll have to read it. Yeah, it, it's very clever because you, you, you realize after you've read the first intro where there's a murder that there is a huge uh, uh, narrative twist. Anyway, sorry, go on. Yeah. Lightning okay, uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. All right. See, I, I don't like coffee, which is sort of the yeah. weird, you know, you being in England. No, I don't, yeah. like, I don't like the taste of coffee. I'm really yeah. un-English. I loathe tea. I think it's just, I think it's the devil. I think it's garbage. Uh, okay. So we'll ask about more fun drinks here. Just wine, Asian, beer. Asian nation yeah. here. <laughs> so you have choices of wine, beer, whiskey, or something else. So I'm just opening up the cabinet for that one. Wine. 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 I love wine. I feel, I feel yeah. like wine is my friend. <laughs> and sometimes my enemy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a real, that sounds like you have a really, like a real relationship then, not just we like really do. One. Yeah. We yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, totally uh, out of the blue question. The Blair Witch Project, good movie or no? I don't know. Both. <gasps> Both. 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 I don't yeah. know how I feel about that. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> no one, none of my friends helped me with this question or your friends or our overlap of friends. <laughs> we're So we're at a British convention. It's like day two, and maybe. Yeah. Uh, and that night, your choice is karaoke or heads of the pub. Oh, pub, pub. You can talk <laughs> in the pub. Yeah. You okay. Know, yeah. I, like I want to talk. I'm there to talk to people. If I if I want to, you know, get up and sing a silly song, I can do that. I can do that right now in my, you know, in the privacy of my horse hair and blood kitchen. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, I want to talk. Because then uh, I only bring that up because at, at at American conventions, like I don't think I've ever seen karaoke, but I hear all the time about karaoke <laughs> at, at British conventions. <laughs> hearing about it is probably much better than actually probably... hearing it. Right. So, <laughs> feel okay. fortunate. <laughs> Two left. How about um, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, what's the most recent book that you read? Uh, Mrs. March by Virginia Fighter. It was great. Ooh, yeah, it is very so good. good. Yeah. Oh my God, I loved it. Um, I, I, I almost feel bad doing this on a, a celebration of uh, of your new book in the U.S., uh, but I want to just say, can you say a word or two about The Sundial, which is coming out in February in the U.S., yes. I believe, which I've yeah, also had March the pleasure 1st. of reading, yeah. and it's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and you were one of the first people to, yeah, people to read it. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, Sundial, so Sundial's about Rob and her, um, who comes to suspect that her daughter, Callie, is dangerous, and that she has dangerous impulses. So she takes her basically on a, on a, on a bonding trip, as it were, to back to the Mojave Desert, to her childhood home where Rob grew up. Um, where her parents conducted experiments uh, and she tells Callie the story of their family while the past and the present interweave and you come to see that they're not as not as unrelated as you might think. Um, I, I'm fascinated by, again, family, but the mother-daughter bond in particular, I think, is often, I, I don't know, it's so powerful and so atavistic and there's a lot of it that isn't very, it's not necessarily pleasant, it's so strong, it's mm. so overwhelming and I think it, I think there's room to explore that. There's no need. I don't feel the need to say that because people have difficult feelings about um, being you know, about mother, being a mother or being a daughter that that there's anything to, less to celebrate there. But the main crux of the novel is that basically Callie and Rob, mother and daughter, each come to suspect the other wants to kill them, um, and maybe they're right, or maybe one of them's right, or maybe. <laughs> Um, but I'm I'm obsessed with the Mojave, and I'm also obsessed with these, you know, the, the the more out there experiments the CIA did in in this in the 70s and 80s, which was just like some of them were so strange I couldn't invent them at all. And there was one when I read about it, I knew I just had to write about. It's just it's just it's so gratuitous and not not very nice, but gripping. Um, and, yeah, that's yeah. a good way of describing the book. <laughs> not very nice and gripping, absolutely. All right, so I'm going to go to our audience questions here. Um, I'll just go one at a time. Let's see. How did you come up with the name Olivia for the cat? Do you know, it's, it's, I, I, I was just thinking of Twelfth Night. She's looking, she's so in love with her, with her, um, with her, the other cat. And was just, and she has such a sort of beautiful pomposity as well. And it just really, it just fit her. And it's, mm. it sounds so poncy to say that you, you named a character after a Shakespeare character, but it really felt right for her. It really felt like if a Shakespeare character was to be a cat, that would be Olivia. Mm. I was going to ask you about Ted's name, if there was any sort of significance to it or like how you came up with, with well, his name. It's very much so. I Without spoilers. The, yeah. <laughs> no, without spoilers. But, you know, there is there's, it's a, it was a deliberate choice. Because obviously the area that we're talking about here is famously the haunt of Ted was famously the haunt right. of Ted, Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy. And, and the, um, the lakes and mamish murders, which are the, probably what I find one of the most frightening incidents is two, two in brief, two women, Janice Ott and Denise Nasland abducted in, in broad daylight on, on a Memorial day weekend from the lakes side with thousands of people from among their families. He introduced himself by his name. You know, he went up to them and said, I'm Ted lured them away two in one day, hours apart. Um, and there's something about that and the way that, and the way that, and also because the, the way that they were found on a neighboring hillside was sort of quite incredibly ghoulish and, and awful. They'd never treated a crime scene like this before. So, and it was the land that ate, that, that sort of started to take back over their remains. Like they had to get excavate finger bones from coyote feces and they had to take the bird's nest from the trees because the bird's nests were made of human hair and there's things like that where the land makes its way into the story where I just thought this is that's the right name for him to have it's not based on Ted Bundy in any way I'd like to mm. emphasize this it's right. not it's it's very different but that what is in the book is the reverberations of my feelings about about that and, mm. and and the event I think you know if that makes sense yes absolutely all right this one has received three votes so it's up front all right Kat, what is the scariest book you've read or scariest movie? Um, I couldn't, I, 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 I read The Haunting of Hill House at broad daylight, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, and I absolutely crapped my pants. It was just, <laughs> it's that, <laughs> not literally, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I found it so unnerving. And even the bits, the overtly scary bits, are just the least of it. They're the tip of the iceberg because mm. you're being led all this way into this destabilizing, really um, 
con confounding, but, but at the same, same time, incredibly sort of like mellifluous narrative. And I thought, I, I, I never read anything that actually made me go cold in that way before or since. Um, uh, yes, I think that's the scariest book I've read. Yeah, no question. And, and I agree with what you said about like the scariest parts aren't, I mean, they're scary, but I think the ending to yeah. me is the most terrifying. Uh, Absolutely. Where she's in the car and, and the realization that's going on both between her and the reader. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and is it that bit see, about why doesn't someone stop me? Is that, yeah. Is yeah. That, and that, that's terrifying too. Why doesn't Absolutely. someone stop her? Yeah. Anyway. All right. What is your favorite part of writing? Setting characters, plot, etc. Mine is being done. <laughs> That's I know, my favorite part. Of I really love having written. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like the in between bit is kind of overrated. No, it's, I, I, I love, <laughs> I do love, I do love doing characters. I think I used, to, I very briefly and very, very ill fated, very brief career as an actor. And I, I think I still have this real, like, um, um, instinctive uh, way of, of kind of wanting to tell a story through sort of, um, sort of voices from the dark, from through monologue, essentially. So I love, I love writing. I love creating characters and the, the strange things. I, I, of, I often wonder. <laughs> often, one, sometimes I just think, what is the strangest thing I can put in this today? Let's see if it works. <laughs> sometimes it does. Um, oh. But I love, I do love creating character, and it's, um, and you know, especially if they turn out to be a, a Bible reading cat. That's always an added yeah. bonus. So it sounds like you don't do a lot of like sort of like plotting or planning beforehand necessarily. Uh, is that true or? I mean, I, I know with Needless Street, I knew where I went. I knew where I had to go. I knew where I yeah. had to end up. I just had no bloody idea how I was going to get there. Um, so that was exciting. I, I do. Yeah. I, I do often write a plan um, and then I put it in a drawer and forget about it. And quite often I find <laughs> that I'm stuck. Smart. Yeah. yeah, there's quite often I find at the, at the end, I look, I look at the plan, I'm like, oh, I kind of did the plan but without, without yeah. intending to. I, hmm. I find if I plot to, if I do like that serial killer board with bits of yarn and pictures of people, yeah. I, I find it just kills it for me. I can't, it stops it being a live kind of wriggling entity, which it sort right. of should be. I am a little concerned with how much you say serial killer and how much you know about them. And anyway, that's an aside. Um, <laughs> this is for both of us. What spooky or scary media are you currently enjoying this season? Um, I will say that, let's see. So I just read Cabino Iglesias' new novel that'll oh, yeah. be out next year called, I'm so bad, I can't remember titles for anything. My, my, my excuses was in PDF. And, you know, if I have the book cover in front of me, I'm going to remember the name. Yeah. Uh, it's the devil takes you, the devil takes you home. It's, it's really brutal horror noir mashup. Oh, yeah. Um, I loved midnight mass. Uh, I love midnight mass. I'm in the middle of it. I'm, I'm yeah. just, I'm in like episode four. It's fantastic. And for me, it's um, like in such, yeah, you know, I would say it, for me, it's like in such a, my wheelhouse of like, as an agnostic atheist who for whatever yeah. reason has been around Catholics his whole life. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, I mean, that part of it has just totally sucked me in. Um, yeah, and, and with my daughter, after she finished watching Midnight Mass, was crying. I cheered her up by watching Session Nine last night. Which, yay, parenting! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Midnight um, Mass. Yeah, for you. I love, I love Midnight Mass. I couldn't agree with you more. And I just, it felt. I mean, there was so much psychological detail and so much thought went into everyone's. It was the most, mm. some of the most fleshed out characterization I, I've ever seen. I am reading, um, The Fervor by Alma Katsu. Which which is an absolute Ooh, blinder. Yeah. I mean, it's so sad. And so it's about the Jap it's set in uh, partly set in the American Japanese internment camps. Right. Um, which is another kind of horror altogether, really. Um, and I, I, I'm finding it absolutely heartbreaking and unput, unput downable. Um, so, and I think that comes out, I think that's next year. I think that's, it comes out in April. I should know. Yeah, I think but, I but, just saw, like, I just happened to see the arc online, like the cover. I was yeah. like, Ooh, I mean, I'd heard about the book, uh, was coming but oh that's great she's so good um, isn't she though like yes. I mean, everything she does is just insane like I, I don't think i'll ever be the same after the hunger really mm. all right so uh when you're in the process of writing a book like needless street do you read similar books to get the sense of what has been done how to effectively tell the story etc sometimes sometimes it doesn't help sometimes it actually actively kind of um uh sort of paralyzes you sometimes you you because you don't want to end up writing more of someone else's book, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
one book that did help me with it, or that really kind of was a jumping off point for Needless Street was Joyce Carol Oates's Zombie, because ah, it's just such book. a perfect, ah, oh, great book. It's yeah. such a perfect gothic monstrosity of a book. And it's also, I was struggling with this about how do you write the unwritable? How do you write things that you can't even bear to think, let alone right. put on put on the page? And she, she just, I mean, no one knows more about horror than Joyce Carol Oates, and she just, the way that she used perspective and kind of redaction and omission to, to tell the story was like, I was like, ah, okay, I can steal this. No, or, <laughs> or, you know, uh, respectfully <laughs> use this. Um, right. But it's, it was a really, it was a really big influence in, in writing it because it, it, it showed that it can be done. I think they're very different books, hers and mine, but um, yes. But um, it was, it was really, um, it was like, it was, a, it was sort of like a, a permission moment where I, th I thought, yes, okay, so you can do this. Hmm. All right, we've got like three left, it looks like. Uh, what's the most underrated horror novel or book, I guess it could be a collection of stories, you've read? Um, do we know The Vet's Daughter by Barbara Commons? Ooh, I do. I just happened to read that like yeah. about a year and a half ago. It was reissued. Yeah. Uh, it was, I wasn't it? Reissued it, yeah. I can't remember either, but it, it's just, again, it, it starts out proper um, classic gothic and it ends with this absolutely mental um, sort of, <laughs> I don't know even what to call it, magical realism moment. Um, where, whereas if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Um, I'd never heard of it um, and I came, I came across it, I think because of the reissue, it's one of those things. It's like it's like a little in sec in in secret. So, you know, it's either people know about it, and they're they're, they're quite passionate about it, or they've right. never heard of it. The vet, the vet's daughter by Barbara Cummins. Cummins is Barbara Cummins, isn't it? Yes, and, and she has another novel which I like even more. I had happened to read it years ago. Uh, it was Who Is Coming or Who Is Dead? Ah, I'm terrible with titles. Someone out there, Barbara Cummins. I don't know. Find yeah. that for me. But that's a, you know, this town gets flooded, and again, just weird, terrible stuff happening. Yeah. Uh, all right. Would you ever write a book outside the horror genre? I'd love to. I mean, I'd love to write a book where people didn't have such a terrible time, but it, <laughs> in a way, but not today, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, horror is, and, and the Gothic in particular, have this very particular, um, uh, have a, a very particular facility to express, um, things that we don't, we're not really allowed to express um, mm -hmm. as adults or, or, you know, in the daylight, we're not supposed to be afraid of things. And that's what I love about them. That's what draws me to them is they have this, they have, they have this direct tap down into these, into the more, the, the less acceptable faces of, of our, of our kind of psychological makeup. So that, that's, I'm, I, that's, I'm not done with it. Yeah, is what I suppose what I'm saying is I feel like it's, there's a lot they can say a lot in a lot of different ways, and I feel like I've I've got more to write. One day, yeah, I think I think it would be I think it it would be wonderful to write something. <laughs> Not everybody starts dead. Yeah, <laughs> just maybe they end up there. No, I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe. Well, we all end up there. But. Yeah. All right. The last uh, audience question we have is: What is your ideal writing setup in terms of environment? Uh, what do you uh, what, what do you have on hand? Where would you be, et cetera? I really like a train. So I, I like, I, I, I find that um, because, and you'll be familiar with this, Paul, like you stare into a laptop all day, every day. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to change the wallpaper behind the laptop. Um, mm. And I, so I, I tend, when I'm at a certain stage of a book anyway, anyway, and I need to shake myself loose, I tend to do things on the move. So I, I, Took, I, I took my laptop into the woods once when I, I think when at the end towards the end of finishing Need, Needless Street or in the middle of Needless Street I was, took it into the French woods at dusk and wrote mm. it there um, but it worked because just changing your state really helps to helps to helps you helps your brain you know, help your mind float free and I love a train because you're neither here nor there you're never quite you're not quite anywhere and it's somehow mm. your mind gets very excited and maybe it's kind of your sort of pack um, traveling kind of old hunter gatherer brain is like excited to be on the move, but hmm. I, I find it really effective. That's interesting. Uh, two two of my novels began on one was on a plane, it, Cabinet oh. at the End of the World, yeah. and Survivor Song was I was on a train in England where that book sort of hit me. <laughs> I love <laughs> I, I like, love Survivor Song. You know well, how much you. I love I appreciate Survivor that. Song. Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, all right, I think. Well, actually, let's see. 
do we have time? We have time for two more. You you okay for two more? Yeah. Um, so how about this? And then we'll end with what you're working on next. Uh, okay. Not that you've already written enough. You got this book. You got Sundial. Anyway, how did you break into the mainstream publishing? You know, lit agents, etc. What advice would you give to authors? Um, I I did an MA. I did a master's, the creative writing master's. I don't think everyone needs to do that, but a writing group can be useful. And um, it just helps you meet people because um, I, I think access can be a can be a problem. Um, I, so I did I did that, and then, mind you, it took me like seven years to write my first novel. I'm not sure the masters helped that much. Yeah. Um, but it, <laughs> it it's um you know it, it taught, first of all you feel like it's possible because you feel there's a there's an element of validation to it. It's extremely useful for also for receive, for learning how to receive criticism because you just you know just people telling you your work is terrible all the time, especially if you're a genre writer, they'll be like. I'm not even sure you have a right to exist, um, but <laughs> it's true. And, yeah, no, um, it is. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I found that really. Uh, I, f I found that um, I, it's very hard to say what would what 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 would what one would have done otherwise. But I found that a good introduction. I think that um, in break uh, having a strong concept for your first novel is really helpful because. You know that an agent's job is not to is not to write the you know or to or to or to be able to express the glorious subtleties and nuance of you know the of great works of literature. They they they're trying to express very in very short space of time something um, that they that, that has a unique uh, inness and uh, an individual individuality about it. So I think strong concept really helps. That would be my advice. My, my main advice is just write, 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 and read, 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 read. That's the best teachers you'll ever find. Are other other writers, living or dead. And um, unfortunately, no one else but you can. No one else can you but, but can can put in the ten thousand hours it takes. And I still feel like whenever I finish a book, I'm like, oh, I know how to write now. And then I start the next one. I'm like, no, I don't. You know, right. it's, it's just that this the false dawn happens many over and over <laughs> and over. Um, but it, I, yeah, I think you never go wrong by reading and writing uh, as as much as you can, and just being open to, uh, to to receiving life, life really. Yeah. Yeah, and now I want to add, write the fu book to that list. I, I like the, that. Yeah, idea. write the fu. <laughs> write the book of your write the book of your heart. You know, yeah. or your fu book, however you would choose to express it. Sure. Well, I mean, so we will end with, you know, so Sundial's coming in the spring as well. Uh, are you working on another novel currently? Are you taking a little bit of a break? Short stories, Hollywood no. stuff. What's going on? <laughs> no, I'm. Yeah. Well, I'm writing a bit. Of, I'm writing a drama for Audible, um, which oh. is really fun because I've never yeah. done any scripted drama before, and I was like, I d again, it's the sort of thing like, can I do it? I really enjoy it. It's really good. It's about an Arctic research vessel in uh, uh. 20, 20, 2045. Good snow-based horror. Um, it's very, it's quite unusual. And I've got some great, it's not just me, it's, it's me and a, yeah. a team of writers, but I'm really enjoying oh, cool. doing that. I've got another book um, due out with Nightfire and um, and with uh, Viper, my UK publisher, in uh, 2023 called Looking Glass Sound, which is about a writer who, in fact, I'm going to have, maybe I can, I'm going to have to pick your brains for New England research if we're still COVID bound. <laughs> sure. it's, yeah. it's about a writer who goes to a cottage in New England to write um the uh, a revenge novel about his dead college friend who was much more successful than him but then it turns out that perhaps the dead college friend is not as dead as they may seem and as with all my books you're nothing, writing my nothing, biography nothing, no i'm just kidding yes there we go <laughs> and as with all my books nothing is as it seems but i really like the idea of um you go through all the different manuscripts and all the different different books that these two writers write so you get like there's several characters um cast in various in both genders because they mm. rewrite and so it's a fun it's really fun to it's quite a hall of mirrors but um i hope i can do it again i just hope i can do it that's the best i can say at this yeah. stage well, i'm um, sure you can oh we'll see i'll let yeah. you know well, that's exciting yeah all right i guess we'll call uh kelly Ann back in you know thank you you know cat for for doing this is a lot of fun and everybody bye Last House in the Street. Yay. There's that five yeah, books with the signed house. personalized book plates oh. link below. Yeah. Yes. And thank you so uh, much, Paul, for doing this. Thank you, Kellyanne, so much for I'm having sure. me. And thank you of all for course. coming. And it's just so nice. Thank, thank you. you both for joining us today. Our 
in the afternoon for us San Diegans and the evening for you guys. <laughs> I just want to remind everyone in the audience, if you are interested in any of the books that Kat and Paul talked about, uh, you can find the links in the chat. Shout out to my bookseller helper, Victoria, for putting all of those there. Um, I do want to remind everyone that uh, COVID, the gift that keeps on giving, uh, has caused like a big shipping shortages in publishing and the book world right now. So if you want to read these books and if you want to gift Kat's or Paul's books to people this holiday season, order as soon as possible. You can do that by clicking that green buy books button. With that, thank you guys so much for a lovely event and we'll see you next time. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye everybody.